Um, I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, Heather, do you want to do the roll call? Sure. Scott Williams? Here. Allison Gould? Here. Um, Scott Bullwick? Here. Roger Lang? Here. Tom Duster? Here. Um, Ken Pearson is out today. Nelson Tipton? Here. Wes Lowry? Here. Kevin Bowden? Here. Francie Jaffe? Here. Chase Nelkins? Here. And Heather McIntyre is here. Council Member Martin, I don't see you yet, but okay. if you have a quorum. Great, thank you. Before we get further into the agenda, uh, Tom actually sent an email and, and and I think it was a great idea. I appreciate that you brought this up. Is maybe allowing the new board members, um, Tom, Allison, Scott, to maybe just a few minutes to give kind of your background. I think that may help the existing board members, the older tenured <laughs> board members, to understand kind of what your background is as we get into the conversation. So I, I think that's a great idea. So Tom, maybe start with you if you want to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Tom Duster, newest board member. Uh, I met most of you last time and appreciated that, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, uh, just a little background on myself. I'm a, a clinical track assistant professor, which is just, uh, I'm mostly on a teaching, teaching track down to CU Denver. Um, so I'm in the geography and environmental sciences department. Um, my background uh, tends to be uh, more on the water quality side. Um, so uh, my undergraduate degrees uh, or degree was in uh, like stream ecology essentially, um, and uh, but my graduate degrees are both in more the kind of geochemical realm. Uh, so more uh, contaminant fate and transport and water treatment. Um, those were both through engineering uh, departments, but I am not an engineer, so uh, I'm, I'm more on the science side. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, I teach uh, at CU Denver, as I mentioned, in courses like, uh, um, let's see, uh, aquatic ecology, aquatic chemistry, um, uh, soil uh, science, um, as well as the introductory courses in environmental science and geology. Um, and then I, most of my research background is on uh, water treatment, particularly with respect to uh, uh, remediation of contaminants uh, in situ. Um, and so that, uh, and, and water, water treatment uh, application, or kind of characterization of materials for uh, water treatment applications. Um, I was really, uh, and, and then I should mention that I, that, uh, one of the courses that I've taught most, most recently was on uh, water energy in Texas along the Front Range, and actually that was the course where um, I developed where I finally felt comfortable enough to say maybe I know enough to be on the water board. So that was that was the course where I decided that this might be a good idea. So um, I'm still coming up to speed on a lot of stuff around here, of course, but uh, as I think all, many of us are, right? It's never ending, I suppose. But uh, I was really, just, just lastly, I was really touched last time by this kind of concept of, of, um, of a water kind of mentor, right? Like that like got brought up several times by the people that were departing the, the water board. Uh, if I were to assign a me water mentor, it would be uh, my dad. Uh, he was geotechnical engineer for um, Bureau of Reclamation uh, for 30 years, uh, mostly building dams down on the uh, Central Arizona project. So, um, but we uh, we did a lot of work, or, or kind of, you know, uh, I'm from around here, so lots of, time up in the mountains and stuff around here. So lots of uh, time, you know, just uh, kind of more, you know, just uh, casually, I guess, exploring the water systems and stuff around Colorado. So anyway, thank you Great. for the opportunity sure. uh, to explain this, because I, I just, hopefully it's something there it is a way in which I can help. For sure. That's awesome. Well, welcome yeah. and thank, thank you. you. Yeah. So I guess I was going to go down the line for the quote unquote new board members to give a little overview of their uh, experience and history. So Allison, if you'd like to share. Yeah. Well, hi everybody. I've seen y'all in person less than a month ago, so it's <laughs> kind of feels new. Um, so I'm also from around here. I grew up at 95th and Isabel, mm -hmm. where my parents still are. So this is just home. Um, went away to undergrad, studied biology, came back to Colorado because it's Colorado. And um, went to law school at DU, and then 
I went, I had to have my own room right after that for this elementary and resource lab. Practiced for about nine years in private practice, actually working with Scott some. And uh, about a year ago, I transitioned over to the Colorado Water Trust, which is a nonprofit that basically works on water transactions for environmental purposes in Colorado and works statewide, but um, focused a lot this year at least on the Niagara Basin. So that's been really interesting to, to learn up on. And other than this, um, I love playing soccer with my kids, <laughs> and they're great. And Love to bring them up here in Thank you. Scott? Yeah, hi, thanks, Todd. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I uh, am the only one, I think, I don't know Roger's background substantially, that is not a local or has grown up in Colorado. I'm an interloper, but I've been here for 25 years now. Came to Boulder County in 97 um, for law school. As a second career, I was in medical sales for a decade before I came and went to law school here. So I've been in Boulder County uh, since then. I've been in Longmont since 2000. I bought a house in Old Town then. I've been there for quite a while, and I've been working at Lions Gaddis for close to 20 years. Um, I started practice in Boulder at a different firm and migrated up to working four blocks from my house, which is pretty cool. And since I've been at Lions Gaddis, I've been in uh, a water practice. Um, I represent mostly um, people and entities in Division One, which is the South Platte Basin. So almost all my experience is here locally. Uh, Allison's talking about where she grew up. You know, the, the, the first head gate um, in Northern Colorado is right down the road from me, right? Uh, on 95th and Boulder Valley Farms, where Lower Boulder devotes with their 1859 water, right? We've represented Lower Boulder for decades um, and still do. And uh, so I've been doing ditch company work and conservancy district stuff and water district stuff and municipal work for oh, a pretty long time. Mostly water rights and a lot of water quality, so all my questions go to Tom. <laughs> I've had the, uh, the pleasure of working with most of the people in the room in a professional capacity as well as getting to know them over the years, um, including David, who uh, used to be my wife's boss at Boulder County because she worked in the ag group there. So we've got uh, a lot of ties to Boulder County as well as the city of Longmont. And I served on the planning commission for Boulder County for a decade, um, so almost all of my Land use issues are local, almost all my water use issues are regional, but I've been here for a while and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all. And uh, I don't know if I have a mentor, I've learned from a lot of people, obviously. Uh, Jeff Kahn is still kicking in our office after practicing for 40 years. And he and I, he's getting ready to go on sabbatical tomorrow, so that's why I was a little bit late, Todd, trying to get all of his download because apparently I drive his car when he's not around. And that's daunting. <laughs> Great. That's all I got. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Scott. Sure. You know, Mr. Point, Scott, and Allison might know a little bit about me. I know Tom was not. Sure. Maybe I'll just yeah. 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 quick background. I, I was not born in Colorado. I was born in South Dakota. Went to college there at School of Mines and then came out to Denver and uh, my career is with the Bell System. Mm -hmm. I'm a mechanical engineer and uh, I've been on city council for about eight years and as mayor for a couple of years and that was really my emphasis to get involved you know you watch water rates and you try and represent what's in the best interest of people that was my desire i'm a water expert i know how to drink water in my life. <laughs> <laughs> i am not an expert i'm pleased that we've got this kind of expertise here at the table so but uh, at least you know a little bit about me yeah and if i can go to you for a second um, what, what part of south dakota uh it's just like saying, are you from Colorado? I say Longmont, and they say, no, I say Boulder. Oh, yeah, I know where. South of Sioux Falls, which Yankton for I know where Anybody know where Yankton is? Yeah, oh, yeah, I know where Well, hey! <laughs> <laughs> How about that? We, we have a long history in, in uh, South Dakota, both the eastern and western parts. And in fact, my dad failed out of the School of Mines before, uh, before actually going on to a pretty successful time at, other, at another college after going away to Vietnam. But, but yeah, uh, after going away to, to Vietnam, oh. you know, and, and oh. um, but so you know, growing up a little bit, I guess. Yeah. 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 yeah, but but he, uh, but anyway, yeah. So a bit of a connection. Yeah. Yeah. The Yankees known by the yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> I guess if I'll give you my two minute worth, since <laughs> the new board members and my background. So 
I'm a water resource engineer. I went to the Colorado School of Mines and then actually went to Colorado State and got a master's in water resource planning and management. Um, I worked a little while in consulting engineering and then worked at the city of Greeley for about eight years, ultimately as their water resource manager. Went on to the city of Aurora for a, a relatively short stint as their deputy director of um, water resources. Um, or their deputy um, director, I should say. And then I, I left and I've been doing consulting work um, as well as kind of helping in some family kind of business. Um, and since then I am, just so everybody knows, because it kind of plays in, I may have to abstain on some items if there's a vote, as I am on the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District and the Municipal Subdistrict Board of Directors as well. So I'm um, like third um, or fourth generation from this area. You heard my grandfather and my dad have kind of followed in the, the water footsteps a little bit. So, anyway, just a quick overview. So, Marsha, we were just trying to get everybody kind of acclimated <laughs> since we've had a lot of turnover on the, the board. So, yes. Um, um, well, since I should probably introduce myself because uh, we are going to have a discussion today that originated with the public and the city council pretty much simultaneously. Um, so I'm Marsha Martin. I'm the Ward 2 City Council member and the Water Board Liaison, also the Woody Gap Participants Liaison. Um, I am a, an engineer by trade, a software engineer by trade, um, uh, and know a lot about renewable energy, but not so much water. Um, because the Windy Gap Furman project was a major issue in the campaign when I was elected, I studied Colorado water law as hard as I could that summer. Uh, and, it, you know, learned about things like the compact and rights to exhaustion versus rights to uh, use, single use rights. Um, so I came in here knowing the basics as well as the basic points of conservationism. But this board has been my, and this staff have been my water men mentors because uh, those are big abstracts uh, that are important to know when you're discussing policy in the city council, but they also um, don't tell you nearly enough about the application of those laws. Uh, so I have really appreciated the expertise on this board all along, and I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion this afternoon. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I could, I, and because we the, the COVID situation, we haven't been able, staff hasn't been able to reach out like we normally would to the new water board members. And one of the things that we typically do is go over some of the um, pertinent cornerstone documents and such. So before you leave, I have a flash drive that includes a lot of those documents, as well as a majority of the citizens guides to different things. There's a six or eight, there's a couple that weren't in there that I'm just gonna give you hard copies. Um, for the two of you, you probably have a pretty good understanding of the Colorado Interstate Compact and some other things, but you're, it, the point I'd like to make is send that to you guys, and then if you would like to meet or schedule a time to meet with Ken and or I, um, uh, at some point in the future, we'd be happy to, to do that. Just have, weren't able to really do that very effectively uh, pre COVID. So, okay, great. Yeah, Allison, oh, I would love a tour. Since and we're going to talk about okay, and we're going to talk about that here yeah. later in the week. So, great, great point. Okay, um, with that, we'll go get kind of back into the uh, agenda here. So, item three is the approval of the previous month's minutes, the uh, July 19th, 2021 minutes. One note there is I mentioned to Heather um, in that um, I think it was related to the uh, Erwin Thomas um, final part of that discussion. It was the agreement that had actually Todd Duster, who used to get rid of Todd and board member Duster. And then that same thing was in the later you put up that phone. Yeah. But anyway, that was the, the one comment that I'd, I'd make. So. Yeah, page five and page 13. Okay. Was there any other questions, comments on the meeting minutes? If not, we need a, a motion to approve the July 19, 2021 meeting minutes. Mr. Chair, to approve as modified. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right. Allison second. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Okay. Hi. Hi. No worries. No worries. All right. Um, so item four is the water status report. Yeah. Yeah. It's the lucky that you know. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, the flow of the St. Green uh, Creek at YMCH today is 63 CFS. And the 124 year historic average um, for this date is 119 CFS. Call on the St. Grand Creek was a Niwot ditch, admin number 5631, with a priority date of June 1st, 1865. Call on the main stem of the South Platte River is Fort Oregon Canal, admin number is 11979, with a priority date of um, October 18th, 1882. So St. Grand Basin storage at the beginning of August is at 82%. Um, Ronald Price Reservoir at Butt Rock uh, Preserve is full and we're releasing approximately 40 CFS. Um, Union Reservoir is down approximately 700 acre feet from full and we're releasing 15 CFS. So um, the call is starting to get more senior. So when that happens, we start making fully consumable releases out of Union through all that hole. That's kind of a, how we use our uh, lower, lower water rights um, that we store in the reservoir, or change decrease. Any questions? Any questions, Mr. Nelson? No, oh, I don't see any. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, next item, Heather, do we have any public invited to be heard or no, special presentations? Mm -hmm. All right, um, keep moving. So item six is agenda revisions and submission of documents. Is there anything there? No, no, no. Okay. All right. I we just want to note um, typically in August we do elect officers. However, we didn't get that on the agenda for this mm -hmm. one, so we're going to move it out to the September meeting. Yeah. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Okay. Um, development activity. West doesn't look like there's any to this one. Okay. On uh, item 8A, which is the Irwin Thomas Water Supply Agreement. Western Canada. Uh, before you start, Mr. Oh, Chair, yeah, I, may, I apologize. Continuing from last month's team, um, because our firm represents the developer, I'm going to recuse myself from the conversation. Otto, if you want me to leave the room or yeah. if I do what I did last time, I don't think I'm okay you. with you if, if you're abstaining this listing as a public meeting yeah. and you'd be able to watch it after the fact, anyway. So I'm okay with that unless there's an objection. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, um, what I have, what, what's been included in the board package is a um, kind of an update to the water supply agreement for the Irwin Thomas property. So in July, the board members reviewed and recommended council approve two water supply agreements for the Irwin Thomas property. Um, the temporary agreement is still in the form recommended by the water board, uh, but the longer term reclamation agreement had a minor change. Um, this change was not in the water lease language, but rather the language pertaining to the responsibility of the parties. So the, um, what's before you is highlighting that change for you to discuss whether or not you believe that was substantive or not or changed um, um, uh, your recommendation to the city council. I did want to uh, bring up to the board that originally, this item was going to go in front of uh, City Council uh, next week. It's been postponed until September 14th. So, um, uh, at least at this time. Um, have to bear in mind, this is one element of everything that's going on with the Irwin Thomas. There's items related to Costco. There's items related to affordable housing. It's possible it may continue to be uh, postponed, but as it relates to the uh, um, water supply agreements, the only change was that which we included in the packet. Um, staff didn't believe, uh, believe that it was still substantially in the form approved by the board, but was looking to see if the board concurred um, with that. Um, if there's questions, I may be able to answer them, um, but the idea is that we would bring this also um, at, uh, back to the water board next month to, to look at. Um, the only thing, Todd, we've talked about, I believe, I may have this wrong, I believe
believe the next water board at monthly meeting is September 20th. Okay. And then that will be after the September 14th uh, meeting that will go to city council. So um, the board's not required to take action. You've already taken action on this. It was just that there was a small change. It didn't affect the agreement. But because of the nature of everything that's going on with the early Thomas agreement, we wanted to bring this piece in front of the board to have a discussion on if you probably can do that. Okay. All right. Um, I'll open up to the board. Any? Okay. It just this looks like some minor changes. I don't know how significant they are. Such as rather than consultants retained, you're going to have our own attorneys. Just I mean, are these all that? I don't see anything consequential with this. We don't believe they are. That's why we believe that it's still the. the Agreement as you recommended back in July that they were, it's still in substantively that form, but because there was a different change, a change we thought we'd bring it back. Okay. Uh, we don't believe that this Regardless. affects the water lease agreement in any way, but we just wanted to be 100% transparent as, as we know it to be today. Okay. Any other questions or comments on that? Uh, just to, to try and go about it and how the procedure came about here, who proposed these changes? And I may be looking a little bit with David, uh, but um, there's multiple parties that are involved. I don't believe these are Longmont related changes. These are changes that were between AI and Goldman's. Correct. So, yeah. Okay. Um, one comment I've got is. Um, I guess what, what I'd be curious, I, I don't, I'm not going to speak directly to these changes, but the overall agreement, we have a kind of a temporary, I guess during the mining agreement, and then we have a longer term lease. The longer term lease is 20 years, and I think Longma has the ability to not agree to an extension of that. My question is, if, if the intent is, is that's part of the permanent reclamation? Wouldn't they have to go through and get an uh, augmentation plan to ultimately offset the evaporative losses from the, the gravel mining if they're not lining the pit? And I don't know if that's the plan or not. But, but if it is, I guess my concern is we've got a 20 year agreement, yet they're going to be going to Waterport. And I would assume that, that they, Waterport may want a permanent augmentation source. And then what is that? We have the ability to say no at that point. I just, I guess I'm curious what the thought process was in putting that together. Um, and I don't know if we need to, to, if there's been somebody who's been more involved in the negotiations on how everything fits together. My concern would be if, if this sells to a HOA or a build homes around it, 20 years is up and we say we're not gonna extend anything, what are they gonna do? And if they're citizens of Longmont, how does that play out? I guess I'm just curious of what what the whole plan is on, on the longer term agreement, so. Yeah, and, and so, fortunately, I'm not gonna be able to speak to what would happen in every, you know, should that occur. Um, the agreement, that the long-term agreement, the 20-year term agreement, is what it is. And I can, I can understand the concern, what happens, should water court ask for something more, should they, should they um, need something different. But as I understand it, all the Longmont was gonna be able to do at this point was to um, grant this 20 year agreement. So um, the background of what the discussions, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't a party to those. Yeah, one was a part of the so society. to get a flavor for that, I don't know that that would change the agreement. It may help in your understanding as to how did we get to this point? Um, well, I think there may be two points there. One, it would help in my understanding too. And I think where we came at the last meeting was if there's development plans for the project, for the, the gravel pit project, the water board would have the chance to kind of review and approve those. So there's kind of another bite of the apple, so to speak. Uh, but I would like to know kind of what the long-term plan, my concern would be once again, it gets transferred to an HOA. There's a 20 year agreement. And if that transfer to the HOA happens in the interim, and then if there's some sort of expiration, do they claim hardship? What do they do? And if it's within the city of Longmont, 
that that just seems like a, a glaring hole that I would like to understand kind of how the pieces fit together. So I don't know if we can do that um, next month to have somebody give us some insight. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I would say, you know, unfortunately, you know, people are really more involved with that south side of the road with the uh, long-term right. development. You might know, mine and Ken a lot more on the north side with yep. the open space and our concerns about augmentation that we'd have to take care of is through the open space program is where I sat down and talked about more. That sell side probably would be a Dale, Ken, and you know the Reggie's kind of right. AI piece. So I, I would say probably push out next week, next month and having us do a little homework be a good way to manage that. And I'm fine with that. I just, I think it'd be important for us to kind of understand how the pieces fit right. together. And maybe what we can do, um, I did mention that uh, the tentative plan is to go to city council on September 20th, which is after the board work next meeting. I understand it would be my ordinance, and it would be not less than two weeks in between the second reading. So we can have a conversation uh, at the staff level uh, whether or not it would, and maybe um, whether it would bear to have a meeting before it goes to city council or there would be sufficient to have one at the next water board meeting if you're uncomfortable with where this is where the agreement is at this point then it would probably be i would think it would behoove to have a meeting before this plan to go to city council otherwise i think we could probably have um you know re, uh, offer to have the, maybe somebody from the city attorney's office to the extent that they would be able to speak they'd probably be able to speak half of themselves. I don't know that they'd be able to speak for the Goldens or for Costco. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, we can we can look into that. Well, I, I think maybe it is one we're asking the Goldens and the owners of the property, do they have, maybe they've got right. water rights they plan to tie into that long term and that would alleviate a lot of my concern. But the way it's written, there's all that, I think a lot of that's kind of left out of it. And, you know, I think they do have some water rights that they're going to Okay. proposed to be used but that will be their decision um, and I don't know that I'm free to say what those are okay. and that's how well how I feel time is not sure we again because like these negotiations we're at the table with you know lots of other parties too so um, if you get a chance to talk to our council and see where we're, we're comfortable talking I'm not sure that we're all that and I think this group is good to understand those portions of it but I think Councilman Martin had a yeah, down. well, I was uh, basically going the same place, oh. <laughs> which is let's make sure the city attorney's office weighs in because uh, uh, a thing that nobody's mentioned yet is that there could be implied obligations by the city that we just are not taking out of the agreement but are in fact there. So, you know, we're saying what happens if it may be understood by the CAO but not by us. Okay. Well, that'd be great. I, I think if you bring that back next month, I guess in terms of the timing, um, Marsh, are you okay if it comes after the, the first board meeting, but prior to the, the personally, board? I am. Okay, <laughs> I think that's fine. Okay. So report back. Just go ahead, Allison. Um, I I concur. I think it'd be really important to understand the long term plans with that, right. um, especially if and it seems to me that that would be something that would be addressed by actually the water court get through, and that gives you handle in one of two ways. One being just cessation of the application plan itself, which seems like it would be problematic and then there'd be delayed completion so you'd have to bump that back further or if they were acting on their water rights but that would have to be really nailed down so i'd like to understand more about whether or not those are terms and conditions that are being discussed and how they might be um, included as a part of the decree that is ultimately issued great great questions and again um all things that uh, i think are been talked about but i said again with that have our attorneys tell us what we can share and can't share those negotiations. I feel much better if we just kind of make sure we um, check with that first. Okay, that sounds good. I'm just wondering, and I know Tommy has your hands up, but I, I know that there, I wonder if they, if we could offer up to see if a representative from the Goldens would be interested in coming and presenting because that would be one not having to speak on behalf of someone else and make you feel a whole lot. <laughs> well, in the way the agreement's written, I think they have that obligation right. outside of what's in the agreement of Walmart. So I think that's perfect to have them come and speak. We might be able to, we'll reach out to them and see if they would be. But I think you guys understand the, the issue. I do. So yeah, if that can be related to them and they can explain that this is how we're going to address that, yeah. I think that would be wonderful. 
Go ahead, Tom. I, I think everything I was going to say has been covered. Awesome. Okay. Great. So, with regards to this, do you what do you need from us? What? Really, we don't need necessarily anything. I think what, the way we've uh, but what we did was right. Is whether you, if you believe it still exists and substantially the form is approved by the water board at your July meeting, and that's that's the. Does anybody have any problems with that? It seems like the uh, changes are minor. Okay. So. Okay. We don't really need anything. All right. That sounds good. So welcome back, Scott Holwood, to the, the meeting. Uh, so we're on to, to item nine A, which is a. Cash and loan methodology discussion. Um, and Ken did a write up of the West. Are you going to give an overview of what's included in the yeah, plan? Yeah, I will. Okay. So, um, with the, for the city of 42. Uh, so, bear with me. This is a little bit redundant, but um, just to be sure that we're all clear. Um, on July 27th, the city council did approve uh, the water board's recommendation to increase the fee for cash and loan. $18,528. They did at that meeting uh, ask Water Board to review the policy basis for long bus current methodology for setting uh, the cash in lieu recommendation. And so, what we wanted to do um, today was just to provide the board a little bit of background uh, and talk a little bit about the definition of uh, legal basis and policy philosophy. We're um, not looking for any real recommendation. We're going to come back in September to have the a more a thorough discussion with Water Board about what this policy is and give you guys a chance to uh, discuss that. So, if you will, let me just go through the background that uh, got us here today. So, as everyone recalls, that Longmont became a home rule city back in 1963. And as such, we created our own charter and, or, um, and everything. Shortly thereafter, uh, in, the in 1964, the city um, created what was referred to as a raw water policy. And that policy was that um, at time of annexation, you would transfer all historical water rights and pertinent to the property. And if those water rights were insufficient to provide at least three acre feet of water per acre of land, the remaining deficit would be made at time of planning or further development. That's still the that's still the exact same way we look at it today. Um, uh, in 1988, um, there was a question similar to this brought in front of Water Board, and um, at that time, a study was done, and it, it evaluated. How Water Board looked at cash in lieu. And in that report, it was determined that the marginal incremental cost pricing method would provide uh, a sound practical means to determine cash in lieu of water rights uh, uh, fee. So basically, they looked at many different ways of looking at them. They boiled it down to really three different ways. Um, the one that they determined was the most uh, appropriate was the marginal incremental cost method. And so, and as it is, that's really what you're using today. You're look, we're using that same marginal incremental cost method. Um, but it also went on to say that, um, when I looked at that, that uh, representative of the current cost of direct uh, flow of water rights, the marginal incremental cost pricing method was based upon the economic principle that the annexed property should be responsible for the cost of the latest or next incremental or next increment of raw water capacity, uh, which they caused to be purchased. So we, that's that's I, I copied that verbatim right out of the report, and you kind of as I'm reading that from 1988, hopefully you can see that this could probably be pertinent to uh, the decision that you all have made. To look at Windy Gap Fermi, that we're looking at the marginal incremental cost pricing related to the next uh, uh, raw water capacity project. That's one that we're actively a part of. So we're continuing to follow that. Accordingly, cash in lieu of water rights fees should be 
designed to derive the incremental cost of raw water as may be turned determined by recent experience of planned future acquisition. So basically, they're looking at saying, what's our water needs going to be? And how are we going to satisfy those? And if it's through the, uh, whatever the project is, that seems to be the best way to look at it. Um, so in 1997, the, uh, the raw water policy was adopted by reference. So we finally, we've been having a policy. It's always been a policy, but we wanted to sort of formalize it. And we adopted it in the, in the Longmont Municipal Code by reference. Then in 2004, it was codified in the, uh, in the uh, Municipal Code. So again, trying to give, honestly, the policy just some more teeth. Because once it's in the code, it is, it is law, not just not just the policy, even though we refer to it as the raw well, water requirement policy. In 2015, um, as some of you may have recalled, um, Water Board took a uh, recommendation to increase the cap the fee for cash and blue water rates received, and at that time. Uh, City Council asked Water Board to look at it in a or consider looking at s establishing that fee in a different, a different way. At the time, there was more uh, emphasis given to the selling price of CBT. The idea, bear in mind, the idea is that when you bring cash in lieu of water rights received, the idea is that Longmont can take that cash and, if you will, convert that into water. We could go and buy water rights and put those into the plant. We could buy water rights, water rights, add municipal use, and take them into the water treatment plant. So CBT, by, the, by its very nature, allows us to take those water rights immediately into the water treatment plant. And so it made a lot of sense to reference CBT. But in, in the mid to, like around 2015-ish, the price of CBT skyrocketed. And so there's always other things in the big picture um, and that city council has to manage and look at. Um, and the fee for caution blue was one of those things. And understanding the importance of development in Longmont, they asked a water board at the time to go back and look at how it was looking at specifically setting the fee for cash in lieu. So we had a number of discussions, staff with Water Board, and um, in reviewing back, you know, what was the core of the way that we were looking at uh, setting that fee, it was determined that because of the status of Windy Gap Firming, that being the most likely project that we would be a part of, that that should probably have greater weight into setting that fee. And so from that time forward, we've been looking at the, the cost on a per acre foot basis to be a part of the winning gap for project. And so, um, um, so at any rate, the, if you went into the city code, the definition is that cash in lieu of water rights means cash that is to be paid to the city in lieu of dedicated to historic water rights to the city, and cash in lieu is not acceptable for dedication in lieu of historical water rights. So the way it practically works is if you annex a piece of ground, if you have no historical water, it's okay. You've satisfied the policy because you don't have anything to bring in. However, at planning or further development of the property, you still have to satisfy the full three acre feet per acre. So if you looked at it, each annex property is unique. One may have three acre foot per acre remaining. Some may have enough historic water to satisfy all. In those cases, when they further subdivide or develop, they have no further deficits. So it really depends on, on a case by case basis. Um, the legal basis for cash and lieu, um, and I'm not gonna speak for the attorneys, you, you guys are the experts and everything, but uh, in the Colorado Revised Statutes, it speaks to an impact fee, 
and the city's fee for cash and little water rights received is that type of impact fee. So this is where we kind of have the authority to ask for cash and little of water rights received from a, from, through the Colorado Revised Statute. So that's kind of the uh, where we where we've gotten today. Um, we have the uh, I, I've included in the last paragraph our the policy philosophy, and that's where I think city council was asking um, kind of the board to kind of give some uh, additional information on our policy, different options to look at it. In a way, it felt like kind of what they were asking Water Board was to look at similar to what was done in 1988. You know, look at it from one way or another way or another way and then give the pros and cons to those different ways. And so um, we didn't have enough time to put that information together for this meeting. But we did want to let Water Board know that's a, been a request of, of, uh, of City Council. Um, I wanted to make note, and it's on page 44, that the basis for Water Board's recommendation right now it says, shall, uh, and actually, what we said was, it's, let me find it here. Um, I didn't want to have to read it verbatim, but it says in the raw water policy uh, section of the Walmart Municipal Code that the basis for Water Board's recommendation shall include the current cost of new water supply projects identified in the City of Longmont's raw water master plan. So your your recommendations have, all, have been based upon new water supply projects identified in the City of Longmont's raw water master plan, one of which is the Winnie Gaffrey project. So you've been following the policy. So I wanted to make that you know, explicitly clear. Um, and then lastly, the, uh, the, value, the valuation rests on the fact that cash and lieu uh, fees in the current future will be used to pay for Windy Gap Firming Project by paying off recently issued bonds for this project. So, um, uh, so we have definitely been using the cash and lieu water rights received to pay for when he got for me. So I don't think there's any question there. I think I think what will be discussed next month is should Water Board be looking at other ways to set that fee? What I think if you read between the lines, and and I'm gonna paraphrase and I'm not gonna use anyone's name, but I think the basic question is is the fee for cash and little water rights received high enough? Is, it, is this the right fee? Is this the right amount? Should it be based on some other, something else? Is it should be based upon a, uh, the expectation of what the cost will be in the future? Should it be only where it is now? There's a lot of different ways you could look at, at this issue. And so what we're going to do is, as a staff is gonna try to put together, looking at several different ways. I'm gonna suggest maybe about three, because I don't wanna, we still have other things to do, and, and that this this is a concerted effort that city council has asked us to uh, undertake. Um, Trying to help give water board some pros and cons to looking at it that way, and then you all can have a conversation whether or not we should look at other ways, whether there's additional pros and cons, and then hopefully, when it's all done, land on the method, the policy uh, method that we want to use to setting the fee for cash and loan. It may very well be exactly the way it is. It may be something different, but I think that's what a uh, city council is looking for the water board, is to kind of have that conversation and then make a recommendation to them. Yeah, I, th <laughs> I, th I thought that maybe some context about what the public and the city council members were thinking about and that does include some things that have, were not discussed at council too about the way the economy of Longmont has changed since 1988. So first of all, the public just thought, hey, all these other cities around here are getting fees in lieu that are based on the cost of CBT water, why shouldn't we? And that is a valid question. Um, 
I made sure that the public and, or at least the engaged public, and the council understood that what the staff and the water board were doing was properly applying the existing policy, which I don't think anybody really realized, you know, um, but, but that's what you were doing when I sat through the deliberations on this board. So, you know, I think that you did that correctly or probably almost correctly. What I think may not be, uh, have been taken into consideration in, in that deliberation was that while we've passed a lot of milestones on the Windy Gap firming project, or I should say the Chimney Hollow Reservoir mm -hmm. project, um, that you know it's going to go forward. The um, the dam is going to be built, and water is going to enter that reservoir. Although it may not be the same proportion of uh, windy gap diversion water as we thought, because the reservoir is going to be used as I probably you guys all know that it's going to be used as a staging area for CBT water and all kinds of other stuff. So. Um, you know, it'll be for the recreation projects and stuff. There will be water in there. We may not know how much water is of, of it is water that we have rights to or how firm that supply is going to be um, because of things that are happening like, you know, Lake Powell getting to be on the verge of not being able to generate electricity and that's electricity that we use. Um, and electricity that keeps us uh, in line with FERC, actually, because it's part of our firm supply. So it's important. Um, that's a thing to consider because possibly the riskiness of the, of the firm supply in Chimney Hollow should be rolled into the price. And it's not right now. Right now it's, it's you know, you assume that, yeah, it's gonna come. It's just a matter of where it's gonna come, when it's gonna come. Um, and you also have an assumption that you know there's a there's an average supply that comes from the diversion that you know mostly it's gonna it's gonna happen a certain way and it'll become slightly more predictable once uh, Chimney Hollow is operational. But the risk is higher now than it used to be. So that's one thing. The other thing is that Longmont's economy has changed. Not only can we demonstrate that uh, surrounding municipalities are getting a much higher fee in lieu than we asked for, but the other thing that is true is that the fraction of our economy, and I'm not even gonna make any suggestions about what this means in terms of the price adjudication at all, but the fraction of Longmont's economy that is gonna come from annexations, not just the fees in lieu, but uh, you know other economic influences of annexation and real estate development is shrinking, okay? There are fewer annexations left to be made in the, in the Longmont planning area. And um, also our economy has been uh, rather skillfully developed. I don't take credit for much of that because I came on the scene too late but it's been pretty skillfully developed uh, to depend more on another kind of industry than real estate development, which was certainly not true in 1988. But now we have, um, we have high tech, we have biotech, we have advanced manufacturing, and we have the craft brewing and distilleries, which are the really the easiest to understand in terms of what they add to our economy because they take really cheap raw materials and they make them into a really expensive export that is out of Longmont planning area. Um, and you know, when you go buy a, a Dale's Pale Ale uh, in New York City, a lot of money comes back to Longmont and it stays right here. And that enriches the city because they pay good wages. It enriches the city because they pay local taxes. That, um, you know, it's, it's fundamentally a different kind of industry than um, uh, 
real estate development, which is kind of the other way around. You know, you buy extensive, expensive materials from um, uh, uh, outside our city because we don't, you know, do much in the way of building materials here. Um, and you sink that money into the ground, and while it sustains the economy and that our, you know, our workers and so on live in it, it doesn't keep pulling money into the city, um, you know, except by property taxes, you know, but it's, it's not at all as big a con contributor to the overall wealth of the city as those export kind of businesses that I was talking about. And that seems pretty far afield from water, but it does cause a change in the proportions to be considered. And again, you know, I haven't done the math, kind of not my job, <laughs> blessedly, um, about, you know, how those different elements should be weighed. But that was what the city council was thinking about or should have been thinking about. That was what the public was thinking about. Now, you got to put some salt on what the public says, because we have some people that are you know, water watchdogs that are just, you know, convinced that we're in the pocket of real estate development and, you know, doing underhanded deals. And then don't pay any attention to that because I know you're not. Um, but I do think that it's important to uh, understand that the environment has changed. And yeah, maybe it is time to do a 1988 kind of, of exploration around it. Um, you know, I think. I think a lot of the, the council and the public were thinking, you know, more like, well, Frederick gets CBT prices, why shouldn't we? But you, you all know that the, that the calculation is more subtle than that. And so, you know, there it is. That's, that's just the background I wanted to give. Thank you. I'll open it up. I, I've got a few comments, but if anybody else want to start, go ahead, Allison. Okay, Wes, thank you so much. That was really helpful to understand part of the baseline and how this evolved. To repeat back to kind of what I heard you say is the idea is to find a way to say, given the X amount of water, if we can't come up with X amount of water, you're going to pay for the difference. But then I want to make it, that's it, you, you started a good point. So when you get to the point of planning for further subdividing of your property, you're not required to pay cash in lieu. You have the option of paying cash in lieu if you choose not to bring other acceptable non-historical water rights. So let's say you annexed a piece of property and you had a certain amount of direct flow water rights that were capable of satisfying all the direct flow components. So you have three acre foot per acre, two of which is direct flow, one is storage. So let's presume you had an annexed piece of property that was able to satisfy all the direct flow but they did not have any storage water on their property. And that's not uncommon on a property that has senior water rights. So in that case, you have one acre foot per acre of storage deficit remaining. Right. When the applicant comes to Longmont and asks and, and needs to realize satisfaction of that remaining one acre foot per acre, they can choose either to go out and purchase acceptable non-historical water rights and transfer those or they can pay cash in lieu, or a combination of, of both. Right. So it's certainly possible, for, and currently, the way the raw water policy is set up is for a property to fully satisfy their deficits without paying cash in lieu. What's not um, available to them is to develop or further subdivide the property without satisfying at least three acre feet per acre. I so I think that's a that might be a distinction because there might be other so what I may say is one of the things that was suggested in 1988 was to look at, and I'm going to use my own words, let's see what every other community was doing up and down the front range. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult because it's not really apples to apples. It's really not even apples to oranges mm -hmm. because there are some communities that will only accept CBT. Or maybe there is a community out there that you just simply pay cash in lieu. The long model has been and continues to allow you the option of finding those non-historical water rights or paying cash in lieu. So I want to make that point. Okay. 
know what else is still going, but to dovetail on that, Wes, can you give the board an idea of how many developers, how many applicants come to Longmont and are able to identify, acquire, and transfer non-historic water rights that are, would satisfy that? Because I'm assuming it's a small percentage, but I don't know. So it's, it's always case by case. It's typically easier for a developer to acquire storage water rights than it is direct flow water rights. And there's a there's a lot of we go down a rabbit hole if I went down, okay. down that road. Stay atop there. <laughs> so um, but what we what I believe has been happening in the recent past is that um, it's been easier for developers to consider using cash in lieu because it's a tangible dollar amount that can be created for them to go to a lending institution to get that financing. Now, if you were to try to explain to a bank that you wanted, you know, 14 shares of Longmont supply, they, you know, they wouldn't understand what we were talking about. But if you said, I need, you know, $189,000 to pay my raw water deficits, okay, now I kind of understand it. It puts when it goes to dollars and cents, it's like the common common language that everyone understands. And so most recently, most people have been bringing cash in lieu. Uh, there has been some developments, though, that have understood that typically you can, a developer can save money by doing non-historical water rights. That's why they do it. It takes a lot more work, but if you put in that work, it's possible to save to, to save to save money. And so it really it really depends. I don't have I we could probably provide a, a rough, you know, next month if you wanted a rough statistic of comparing non-historical water to cash and loot. The way we would show that is based upon the the amount of of uh, credit that they receive for each. Um, so we, we've done that in the past where it's been asked, water board's asked how much cash in lieu have we gotten versus how much non-historical water rights. And previous to the last couple of years, there was a period of time that we were getting a lot of Lake Akatosh reservoir company waters, you know, but we have we only had like five percent of ownership and we're almost close to sixty percent. So and those are the numbers that you're talking about. So I it's there's more cash and lieu that's being used to satisfy deficits than there is non-historic. No. But it's, but it's you know, there still are people that have been developing their own water rights portfolio for in which time they can bring that to Longmont. So, but it takes, the other thing that um, developers understand <coughs> or hopefully understand is when you transfer a non-historic water right, you bring in a third party. So you've got the person that's buying the water, uh, the developer, the person that, the entity Longmont that's receiving the water, but there's also a ditch company involved. And there is a period of time in that transfer that's out of both the city's perspective and the developer's control. And it has potential, it can create uh, a situation where, so Longmont will not uh, Longmont does not recognize deficits being satisfied um, as far as transferring non-historic until we have the stock certificate in our hand. So if John makes a request to transfer a water stock to the ditch company, he's done all he's could. He's made the stock transfer request, he's paid the payment to get that transferred. He can't do anything else, but yet Longmont can't do anything either because we haven't received it. So you always have these dish companies that have to do their business. They have to make sure they're free and clear of liens and cover. And it takes time. And I think a lot of times we, we all understand the adage time is money. And I think that also has weighed into some of the equation for developers most recently. They're like, I want to wait till the last minute to, to, to satisfy it. And then I want to move dirt the next day or the next minute. And so I think that's that's another reason why the 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 cost of doing, choosing to, to pay cash in lieu has probably outweighed the, 
the cost savings to do non-historical water rights transfers. That's really helpful. That gets kind of into one of the questions I was gonna ask. So I've got a loaded question. Okay. Totally <laughs> like, I haven't seen it, but okay. Um, Transaction costs. So they say they come in, it's not a good share. It's a decree for three acre feet of historically used water savings. Uh -huh. Do they have to change it first? So we have a very specific list of water rights that we will accept, and they're okay. identified in the policy. And okay. if you want to propose anything that's not on that list, there's a page worth of stuff you have to provide, then we evaluate it. So and bring it to water board. and then bring it to the water board to evaluate so so generally speaking if it's not a water right that we have already taken through water court not that specific water right necessarily but you know, that company or whatever we have a relatively firm understanding of what's going to happen with it it's been listed out there so really for most people they don't have the knowledge to really go that far down they're just going to say here's the five ditches that we will accept. I'm going to go to a water broker and see if they can help me get any of those. Mm -hmm. And then even if they do identify one of those, there's still conditions that they have to satisfy. Like you can't dry up land. Um, there's, you know, of course it's got to be free and clear things that come in. There's a whole myriad of things that they have to satisfy, steps that they have to walk through in order to get those non-historic water rights passed. And so once they understand that, it, if they were feeling a little squirmish, usually that's oftentimes enough that people are like, yeah, I think we're going to cash it. So where is the HCU analysis right now? Where's the what? The HCU analysis. Historic consumptive use associated with... So, yeah, okay. So... Where's the paper water, but where's the wet water? How do you know? Where's the source? So we base the, the credit that's given on a per share or per unit basis is based upon the average irrigation and head gate diversion. So we... We've looked at from, looks like you guys want to join. Am I missing? Well, let me, let me mention one thing. If I understand right, when Longmont changed all these ones that are on their accepted list, yes. they actually have allowed future dedication of and potential change under the same conditions that were in the yeah, previous right. decree. Yeah, that's right. So the point is, is it's really well established. I mean, where you may be going, which my mind goes to immediately too, is Hey, you got to do a new change case. Right. What what are you going to get when you do the sausage making? What does the sausage yeah. look at the end? Longmont knows that okay. because the way they did their court case, they set it up as they could get dedication of future shares, and they already knew what that HCU. They knew what the yield within their system was, so they feel real confident in terms of the yield that they're given on a per acre foot basis for the supplies that can be dedicated. So the ones that are on that list. Correct. Yeah, those can, that exactly. The ones that are on that list is what we already. <clears throat> Majority of them that we and they list the they list market. the credit that you would receive See. depending on whether it's going to direct flow or storage. storage right. So it's based on those previous water court cases that we've already taken. Right. So to follow that kind of to this logical conclusion, wouldn't be would it make sense to kind of be cash and really be based on valuation of those shares and your term those shares? In that they would be, I mean, given that they are apparently as far as long months considerations, would it make sense to have a valuation done on those? And so let that be you mean on valuation of the shares being proposed to be transferred? The water that is available for those shares. Like the priority comes to you. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think how would, I, I'm just trying to be, think logically. I'm not sure exactly how we would know what it would be for those shares without first taking it through. It what feels like. Where are we yeah. I feel like I'm like an apple or a horse in front of the cart, it, it, you know. So what we're basing it on is prior change cases, with the assumption that we would receive that same similar that there's at least similar, yeah, um, yield from those water rights. But to what we would get on those, I mean, obviously that could take ten or twenty years to get through water court. I mean, we do have some. There are some water uh, rights that have already included shares that have not yet been transferred they're already part of our change case right, right. so when they we've change we're going to receive those years. so yeah. those we understand it's the ones that have not this specific because we've done not ditch wide you know, analysis we've done share specific uh analysis on our change cases so there's a built-in assumption that the 
credit would be the same as prior shares that have been transferred. Um, but that, yeah, that's yeah. that's how those are based right now. But with that uncertainty, it seems like Longmont will be taking on that uncertainty over future change. So to that extent, it seems like then it would indicate that the price should be higher because of the certainty. I understand so I think, what you're saying. Yeah. I think one of the comments, though, is there really isn't much water out there. That Macintosh is probably the one that's been coming in, so there's not other supplies out there. I think the other thing, as I understood it, and it's a policy within a few, when you see the long list of long list policies, one of the policies they've had is not trying to go out and buy water and dry up agriculture sure. outside the city limits. Yeah. So if you follow that to an end, you know, it's kind of like, well, okay, everything within the city is going to come in. It's going to come in through annexation and be dedicated for direct flow and storage to meet those requirements. What's left? I mean, and, and if Longmont doesn't want to go buy or accept and change shares outside of its own kind of area, then then that really isn't, there isn't much additional water that could be derived from these other uh, native water sources. Um, Macintosh is the one exception, as Wes said, it's up to 60% in Longmont's hands, so there's only 40% left that could potentially come in mm -hmm. as kind of a surrogate to cash and loot. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind, is I, I don't think there's there's not much, hasn't been, and there really wouldn't be much in the way of other native supplies that could come in that Longmont could buy or you could base cash and loot on. There just isn't that much out there. It's either coming into Longmont already, or this little bit that's out there, like Macintosh, is coming in as a, as a, you know, as another option to cash and loot. I think the other thing was, you know, obviously what Longmont was involved in is the Chimney Hollow or Windy Gap Firming project. So that was the project that was going to be used to meet hopefully Longmont's build out demand or meet the gap. So that was kind of the one where it's like, okay, that's the project that we know is coming that's going to meet the the future water needs for the city. What's the price per acre foot? And that's how that that determination kind of came about. So that's a little on the history yeah, of it. That's really helpful, and I think that that raises two really important points. One is the policy of it. So to the extent that there is an potentially an underlying wish not to dry out um, currently agricultural lands, one. And then two, also to be able to actually fund the supply that we contracted for. It seems like there might be, to some extent a uh, policy decision that would lead us to lean more heavily towards cash and limited funding our supplies that way as opposed to accepting external water so I, I wonder i guess this is it seems i don't know maybe i'm just excited about this but it seems like this is a larger discussion especially in the framework that we're looking at in terms of the i do want to point out that todd did really summarize the fact that we've done a lot of analysis on what water rights and within our planning area and mm -hmm. it is it's minimal it, it's minimal which is why i raised the question it's kind of strong sure. an argument to even have that in there at some point because right. there isn't really any potential for that's widespread right. use of that that's right so you think of like if you were to go right now and look at the list that's listed of direct flow water rights that are acceptable you know you'd find six or something and you'd be hard pressed to find any of in three of them I mean, it's not to say it's impossible, and, and they're on there for a reason, but again, the ones that we've seen that have came through most recently have been those that were already included in prior long lot change cases. So in other words, once we receive them, they are just like CBT, immediately available in the water treatment plant. We know what that consumptive use component is. And so, you know, even though they're, and, and there's, and, and just, to kind of further clarify, the Longmont planning area, we understand what the water rights are within that planning area. If there's a proposal to transfer non-historic water rights that originated inside the planning area, they're immediately disqualified. We, we will not take them. So that, therefore, the only thing that's really available has to be outside the Longmont planning area. Mm -hmm. and, and the amount, and really when you get out east of I-25, that's not available based upon some stuff that was discussed with city council years ago. So it's a very small amount of available water. Right? Since you, I guess where, where my head goes is we could probably spend a lot of time figuring out a really hard number for something that maybe gets used twice, if you follow me. it's it's That's why I think we've used this 
we, we so far felt pretty comfortable with the values that were established and put in place in the policy for the for the yield um, because even if they were off I'm gonna, I'm gonna make up I'm gonna completely make up a number if a water right was going to give 15 acre feet per share and somebody transferred a full share and we took it through water court 20 years later we got 13. But yeah we, we didn't get two acre feet I get that but keeping it relative to a supply of over 30,000 acre feet you know just trying to keep the economy of scale too I think is it, it will be might be important too to understand how much I don't know if we have a hard number but if you if if you know how much land is left you know the historical water rights that are pertinent of that land is left you then have kind of a pretty good idea a rough number of how much it's even available for non-historic and maybe that too can help you know give an understanding of what's the order of magnitude we're really talking about because Longmont is we're we're approaching I forget the word it's not build out I'm not supposed to use build out but whatever we're we're getting we're growing more to as much as we can so our footprint anyway. so, so I mean what is the the future prospect then and I, I so like what are the confines essentially of what we're talking about here so it seems like if we're appro approaching some future build out again sorry if I misused something but um but footprint or something mm -hmm. like how much water do we need in the future right and does windy gap for example are we expecting that to supply all of it so how much discussion has to be had or how much has already been kind of taken care of by sort of future planning scenarios etc like do we need more water are we going to be on you know in the market for more water or do we need more reserve or, or are we good for the future <laughs> i mean you've asked some really good questions yeah. that really goes into overall everything that we and water board together have been looking at our you know our the the water supply the, our total water supply needs and we'll build out both treated and untreated and um, um, there, there's there's you you've opened up a thing that includes a lot and it's been sure. talked about a lot in terms of you know um, you know the treated water master plan or raw water master plan we've got all these things which you guys are going to say yeah water they're, demands, they're, 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 they're all, all kind of they're, they're really they all have to be looked at collectively to really have a full appreciation nothing really can stand by itself it's all part of the, the whole organism that we are in Longmont but um, again the raw water policy it, you know emphasis added is an area-based policy it, all, it, ha it always has been it's, it's always been not less than three acre feet per acre it didn't differentiate by use and I know that's always been a question and that's something that's many people have asked you know is 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 should why should I have to bring three acre foot per acre if I'm putting in storage units? Well, I'm not telling you you have to put in storage. You're choosing to put in storage units. You know why? But they're also understand too that in the policy there's a there is a place in there that says if your use is going to be greater than three acre foot per acre, which by the way we don't have any uses that are greater than three acre foot per acre right now. But if your use is greater than three acre foot per acre, then you may have you may be required to transfer greater so it's so the policy has always brought enough water to the table to to cover the water demands that would be put on the system for the development that's being a part of it and that's kind of just kind of continuing to follow the footsteps so a lot of it has to do with land use of the land that we have left yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. I know I shouldn't talk to you. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> you guys can, I got, I got a few. I, I can go if you want me to. Okay. Well, which, whichever. I just wanted to throw out a short question sure, and not ahead. entertain mm -hmm. a discussion unless Tom wanted to. Uh, Todd wanted to. Um, but uh, uh, probably on that stick is a graph that shows that um, cholera, uh, that Longmont's water consumption has been not following the growth of the population but following the trajectory that is inverse to the yeah. 
growth of the population. And I myself just took advantage of, from the sustainability office for, for two offers. I had them come and check out my sprinkler system and see how we could reduce the flow. And then I signed up to have my sod removed gratis so that I could xeriscape more cheaply without breaking my back. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> you know, those are, those are things that we're doing and that maybe, you know, the Water Board and Sustainability ought to collaborate. I don't know how much you collaborate now, um, but uh, that sets expectations and it seems like there should be common knowledge about how, what is available to us. Because we could dry ourselves out to the extent that uh, Arizona cities have, you know, by paying people to xeriscape or paying people to put rocks in and xeroscape. Um, so just want to have that in, in everybody's mind as you start figuring out the cost and the probability of, of being able to obtain water. Well, one of the, I guess as I was looking at this, so the methodology we have on cash and loo, you know, this ne next increment, but when you got put in with the project that, that, you know, is going to be that next increment. So as we heard last week at the Chimney Hollow groundbreaking, that was 21 years of permitting. Um, Marsha alluded to it, you know, there, there was modeling that was done as part of the Windy Gap permitting project that tried to come up with storage to yield ratios. And that 18,528 per acre foot is, is a firm yield number based on a storage to yield ratio of Winnie Gap Chimney Hollow um, storage based on how much Winnie Gap units um, Longmont has and then the hydrology and how much we can put into storage. You kind of alluded to that margin. Mm -hmm. That, that I, I guess the point and what you were kind of alluding to, which I agree with, is I think things have potentially changed. You know, I mean, obviously climate change and maybe what, what the, the modeling that was done quite a while ago, I don't know if that storage to yield ratio is, is exactly right. Um, that, that doesn't mean, and I know some people may take that as, oh, that there's no value in my mind. It actually maybe makes the storage more valuable, even though the, the you know, storage to yield ratio may be higher and the cost per acre foot may be higher. Um, I guess I guess where my mind goes is does Longmont try to kind of dig into that a little bit more and say, you know, is there, you know, do we do a safety factor, so to speak, in the interim and then try to do some additional analysis to where we can, and I know there's been a lot of analysis on the Colorado River um, in terms of what that may mean in terms of future operations and yields. Um, but is it one where you put a, you know, kind of a quote-unquote safety factor of 20-30% on that value in the meantime while you're trying to discern or get to the bottom of what that storage yield ratio really is today compared to what it was in the context of the modeling that was done, what, maybe 15 years ago? Um, that makes sense to me um, because I think, once again, we're still trying to tie it to what's that next increment of yield being brought to the system, number one. Number two, I think we're being kind of honest with ourselves in terms of, hey, yeah, things have potentially changed, um, you know, in terms of the temperatures. The city of Fort Collins did a pretty elaborate analysis of the CBT project yields um, because they were looking at it in the context of their drought protection. So they, they did an evaluation of the Colorado River Basin and CBT yields. Maybe something could be utilized in the context of that. But, and I know that would take time and some analysis, but um, I guess that's where my mind goes of, I, I get the kind of maybe wanting to raise that. I think I like staying with our methodology, but maybe being, you know, a little bit more cognizant of, well, maybe that storage yield needs to be adjusted and we adjust that slightly. Because we've seen the price go up on when you get firming just due to the cost of the project, which now I think is pretty well set in stone based on the construction starting, albeit, you know, whatever the inflation ends up being. but. Those other items of the yield of the project um, in relation to what's happened on the Colorado River, that, that's where I think there could be some adjustments. Um, and I, I would be okay with that. So I wanted to throw that out because I think that would maybe give staff a little bit more direction as to what, you know, sort of analysis and just to maybe say what's out there, what can you do and bring back to us to, to try to maybe supplement what we're currently doing in terms of the policy. So that, that's the first item. The, the second is, I guess what I was curious of, Marcia, was you were mentioning kind of maybe this change in the 
city along with the high tech, biotech, and distilleries, breweries. In, in the context of the cash and lieu rate, um, I'm trying to, what's the connection there? Is the connection that it's a higher value of water, um, but in terms of people, what they pay on cash and lieu, how does that tie together with it? I, I didn't quite understand it's, it's, that. It's almost, there's a, there's a couple things, but like, you know, part of it is return on investment. Okay. If, so you guys probably know I don't, and maybe should. If there are, um, you know, six to 10 opportunities for uh, annexations, period, in the Longmont planning area, and you know, a whole generation has to die before we're going to re, you know, reopen our our um, open space to develop it. So we don't need to think about that. I don't think, right. um, but uh, or two generations because it's the Gen Xers that are really hot on it. I think. Um, but so anyway, uh, you know, if it's really six to ten annexations, depending on the size of the bites, then a crude approximation should be good enough for this. You know, you don't want to spend a year evaluating it. And that is that is part of it. Um, but the other thing is just, and then again, it comes down to the number of annexations. The, um, the, or how much water you use is going to really, it's based on residential development. And our population isn't going to be tied so much to annexation in terms of residential development because we're going to have to move to high density infill and the um, water use equation then changes, right? Less lawn, more showers, um, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, I, I guess that's what I was trying to say. Longmont will be probably richer because the kind of industry we have brings money in and leaves it here much more. Um, but its water use pattern is different. And um, I'm kind of missing my own point here. There is another one. Maybe I'll have to jump back in. Sure. Oh. Sorry, it's complicated. No, I, I get it. Go ahead. Just a couple quick questions. I, Take it that our cash and move price is lower than almost any other community. Is that the, the way it is right now? It, again, bear in mind it's kind of comparing apples to oranges, but it's that's the that's probably true. I would think you if you ask developers what they were having to, their cost to develop in other communities compared to Longmont, they would say yes, we're we're, we're less expensive currently than other communities. Mm -hmm. In that, that respect, with respect, with respect to water, with respect yeah. to water, I think the standard. Just I'll give you a ballpark. I think the standard for raw water in northern Colorado is probably fifty to eighty-five thousand dollars per acre foot, and we're at eighteen five twenty-eight. So we're a, a factor of about a third of the lower end. So I guess yeah. what I'm leading towards is to rehash and restudy and try and make sure we are comfortable with how we develop it. Is a thought kind of in the back of people's mind that we're, our cash flow is too low? Yes. I mean, Wait, you know, I, I mean, I haven't heard. I, I don't want to let you come out of this thing if everybody else is forty fifty. I mean, what's wrong with our cash flow? I mean, that's the thought that kind of. I think that's why they came back to the council was asking about the philosophy. How do we come up? Yeah. How do we derive our cash flow okay. value? Yeah. We came out. We come up with the cash flow following our current. Yeah. philosophy yeah. And, and it's by doing that it naturally creates a situation where we're less than other communities yeah. and Tom, I, I just I'm sorry did you catch ahead. your thought I did don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't look. So, so the other thing was that um, in, in 1988 Longmont's economy you know we were a poor city right um, and Longmont's economy really hung on encouraging that development. Right. So we didn't want um, cash and lieu to be a barrier. And that was that was part of the thinking, whether, you know, no matter how you justify it, that had to be part of the thinking. Okay. And the reason I brought up that Longmont's wealth doesn't depend on that model anymore, nearly so much. I mean, some it does, right. 
but infill development doesn't bring water rights in because right. they're already here. Right. So we're only looking at a small number of annexations. Right. So the thing to look at is, well, how much money would the cash in lieu fee, how important would those small number of annexations be um, because in, in compared to the other revenue coming in yeah. to the water fund yeah. uh, and into the city in general. So, sure. you know, you need to figure out the proportionality right. there. And that right. was my other point. But we're not trying to redesign to survive, I mean. Yeah. But the last thing, and maybe you mentioned, all cash and lube monies, are they going to pay down on the gap? Is that... What we're doing they're, el yeah. they're eligible to, and, and I believe the lion share of what we've received so far has been is has been or is will allocated be. toward. I mean, is that our plan that yes, yes. cash and new money goes yes. again? Yeah. Yes, I, I never knew where the money went, so that's yeah. why. I yeah, it's been, it's been building for a purpose for that purpose, and then I think we just I believe the city just got a pretty big check not too long ago for the bonds, and so we're yeah. There is a part part of the water conservation budget is not a, a small percentage. Yeah. 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 goes to that. You water conservation. Yes. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go to Tom and then get Allison if we can. So to that same point, then does that eighteen thousand? I wasn't here for the June discussion. I think it was in June when you guys fixed the the cash and move amount. That amount is basically fixed to the paying down. To, so perhaps, I don't want to rehash things that everybody else knows. So in like two sentences, can you fill me in on like those discussions in like June, I believe it was, where that 18,500 or whatever is arrived at? So basically it was derived at what, at that, at that time, what it was going to cost Longmont on a per acre foot basis to be to be a part of the Windy Gap Farming Project. So it's right. been increasing as time went on, specifically for Windy Gap Farming. And that's the because, cost because, okay, yeah, great. Right. And so because the because there's cost overruns on the on Windy Gap, right? Yeah. But presumably, right, once once that, when, I mean, they've, they've begun building it, of course, there'll continue to be cost overruns, et cetera, but, um, but like the bonds are issued, for example, uh -huh. and so we we have a certain a fixed amount that we're paying on bonds every uh -huh. uh, every quarter or however you do it, uh -huh. and and so we also not just a lower amount, but we have kind of a, a steadier or kind of a, a um, if if some other communities cash and lieu is fixed to CBT, uh -huh. right? With and that's. I mean, we know what has happened with that in the last, you know, four or five years or so. Yeah. Then, like, there's also a certain amount of reliability with respect to our price relative to others, or relative for our cash in the relative to other communities as well. Like, we have just a steadier amount, I suppose, or a steadier. And since we're starting construction, I think we actually we had the ceremonial break, you know, back on the sixth, but we have the. Maybe official breakings like maybe next week, but regardless, now that we have a project that's building and actually moving yeah. dirt, I think those costs have become more certain. I mean, for the last 20 years, we just didn't know because we didn't know what all the legal and everything. And obviously, and you make a good point, it's probably going to change. But in that cost, was a, a component, a safety factor, if you will. If there was a component in those total costs for expected contingencies, yes, and so that's that's been included as well. And so yeah, we don't have, we don't know for certain when it's all said and done what it's going to be, but I think we're more confident in what it's going to be than we knew what, it, what we thought it was going to be maybe five years ago. Yeah. Also, did you have Thank you. Um, to kind of build off the points that I think you guys were raising as far as how it tied to Wendy Gap, as far as like our methodology, um, I think that Todd, I think points really well taken as far as trying to reassess the storage should yield ratio. I think as part of that analysis, one thing that would be really interesting to me is exactly what transit losses look like. Because I think that's a fair distance, not what they're assessed here per mile, but it would presumably make a difference as well as evaporation, especially as our climate gets hotter and drier. So those are two factors that might come into play. I think the final one, and I know it's a little bit more ephemeral, is or just difficult to um, project, is 
what did those transaction costs over the last 20 years look like? And how did that actually uh, affect the price of the water? Um, and then the final thing that I would like to propose for consideration is, as far as water use on certain pieces of property, end use is gonna make a difference as far as how much is going to be returned to the river and how much is potentially available for downstream conversion. So if you have like a huge, you know, I don't, I don't know what they call it, but those, I heard some article of the cooling stuff, they have the Titec business, they consume a lot of water basically, versus something like your agriculture, you're gonna get a lot more return for with agriculture, and it's not, it's apples to oranges. So I think having an eye to what that ultimate use is going to be as far as what actually is going to be necessary to make it sustainable would be something that you might want to take into consideration as far as what that price is. Yeah, and I think I think land use, I mean, we have in, in within our Lama planning area, we have defined zoning for our remaining land as if as yet to be annexed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's been some, I think we, with that, there's probably a, a range of water use you could apply towards the standard for commercial industrial versus the standard you would apply towards mixed use versus high density residential or whatever. And so now I think, I wouldn't say we easily have it available, but we have it more readily available to be able to use technology, technological resources to help us to probably understand what our water use is going to be. And we have been taking that into account. That was part of the um, of our lab, water supply, of water, water demand man. evaluation and stuff. So it's not like we haven't been looking at it. We actually have been looking at it to get us to where we believe, to have that knowledge as to what do we believe our ultimate water demand is going to be. That's And that's what we're trying to accomplish. We're we're different than a lot of cities. We're trying to figure out how much do we need for here to eternity versus other communities. Maybe they don't have that defined planning area. We are defined. We know, you know, but there's always a, I think the best way to, that's been said a couple times and I kind of like it, just that safety factor, that uncertainty of, we don't know what the environment's going to look like. We don't know if it's going to, if two generations later, they're going to change the zoning and make you know make it more dense or whatever, and so maybe from a and from an analytical perspective, sometimes those safety factors are easier ways to adjust the amounts for certain things. Maybe for cash and lieu, where you that factor it can be significant, but it's a, it's a single number that you like if you set a twenty percent safety factor that's that's an easy number you know take your number whatever it is times 0.2 or 102 120 percent you and you have it that in my mind I, it's since i'm working in a lot of the weeds of it it's hard not to it's hard sometimes to pull back out and so with marcia and city council they're always trying to look at the you know the higher level and and they have a lot of other things to look at but i i think as we have this conversation it's there's lots of little things we can look at, and each one of them probably has some kind, it's like a balloon, they probably have some kind of impact, but maybe as we're just having our conversation, everybody's mind's just kind of thinking about it because we're not making a decision here today. Um, maybe the concept of a, of a safety factor, maybe there's a better word than safety factor, but maybe that is a way to respect Council, you know, everybody's concerned that, you know, is what we have out there for cash and lieu sufficient if, if you're kind of following me. So I don't want to say that that's what you should do, but I'm trying to keep it simple because if every single quarter we have to go through an exhaustive analysis, it's going to be tough. It, it's, it's already sort of tough. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm sort of, you know, as we talk about it, if we can come up with a Matrix. I mean, obviously, all that council asked us was to talk about the philosophy. They weren't asking us necessarily to change it. They wanted to understand why are you doing it the way that you're doing it. But I think it's it's certainly possible we can kind of read through that. You know, as to why did they even ask that question? And so that's 
Well, one question I've got. So you guys did the GIS analysis as part of and this Tom was kind of your question of comparing supply and demand. So there's a GIS analysis where they looked at land use, they looked at water supplies on the property. Did you guys come up with, and maybe this is to March's point, of there's only a few annexations left. That there's already right. some that have been annexed, may not have adequate raw water mm -hmm. currently. I guess what I'm wondering is trying to get, do you guys have the capability of looking at it of saying, have you overlaid the water rights to say how much is out there that could be coming in in the context of cash and work? And, and I, I guess I'm trying to frame it, and the, I, I like where you're going, Marcia, because it's like, okay, then we at least have some idea, and the council does. Mm -hmm. How much are we talking about here? So do you guys have so that? that so when we did the, the several times through the years, we've done that water rights evaluation. And it, what's the term? That's not built out anymore. I, I, yeah, you know, I don't know what the new term is either. So, but anyway, so we, we went ahead and took a look at right, the water rights what was annexed, and then I took a generic deficit. Okay. So I would apply those to that acreage. That was just a rough shot because remember, you, when you go to annexation, it starts, you know, you got road right away. Right. Just the whole you piece. Got it out, right. Yeah, so we took the big picture and came up with an overall, if you did cash in, we, we did the deficit, say, like, it came up with, I don't know off the top of my head, but say the number, it was 100 acre feet, we types it by the current cash in, and then send the value of Okay. Well, I think knowing what we think maybe that acre foot, um, you know, deficit that would be yeah, potentially in your cash mm -hmm. may help also, Allison, to your point of the McIntosh shares or the native supplies, how much mm -hmm. could be met with that. So then we get some context of what are we really talking about here mm -hmm. in terms of the number of acre feet. Um, and that was broken up in all areas through the sure. within the planning area. Okay. And we came up by, by areas, and then I just combined it all together, all those areas. I think that'd be helpful to just have that as a point of discussion next month mm -hmm. when we're really talking about this. Yeah. Uh, I should probably say, which I should have at the beginning, um, that thanks to Wes's history, I have a better way of, of, of quantifying this. Right. The council explicitly asked for a policy review as opposed to a value review. So we're talking, this was done in 1988, now we need to do it again. We're not saying we'll have to do it in, in you know, every quarter from now on. We're saying maybe in 10 years when we know more about the climate, we'll have to do it again. Right. Only we won't have any cash in lieu anymore. But what's that philosophy is what yes. I hear in the big picture. That's awesome. Okay. Well, I, I guess, you know, part of today was trying to get some feedback for you guys, so hopefully okay. next. A lot of can bring, maybe bring some information back to the water board that we can have, you know, further discussion with some of the pieces, amount of acre feet that would maybe be subject to cash and loop coming up. I don't know if you can, you know, my idea of the safety factor, what do we think there may be variability? I know that's a big, this is a big question. Quantify our variability, yes. So yeah. What I've usually done with, with those, I usually try to go back to, to either information or documents that we've talked about in the past so don't be surprised if what we do is we pull because some of those questions that you've asked for i think we might have brought to council or the water board okay. but it was water board before you guys were on board so i think we're going to be able to pull right. at least and I, and I even put in my note you know it may be a little bit crude and we can't when we bring it back don't expect it to be within the dollar or within the acre foot but i think sure. we can put it relative right. to what you know what's left and how much is left to be to be done so you can kind of keep that in context sure and yep. so the, the effort that i was talking about was done as part of our latest uh, water demand evaluation right. and, and that's what we we'll pull up and i'll bring that value that i i believe i outlined it in there okay and explain uh what the total is. okay does that sound like we're going scott yeah I, I just want to add one thing wes and i think you're spot on about um the apples to oranges when you're comparing what Longmont's portfolio and needs are relative to other surrounding communities. I work with a lot of other water providers, I know Todd does as well. There's no reason to evaluate what other people are doing and say, gosh, are we doing it better than we are? Because it's, it's for a different application entirely. The one exception maybe, you already brought it up, is Fort Collins. It is a mature water uh, community with senior water rights, a lot of early changes. They have a build out whatever that word is, capacity that they're looking at too and looking at those deltas. So an approachable like 
situated municipality who would probably be useful to understand their philosophy, not the way they're doing it, but how, how they're trying to figure out how to bridge that gap. Yeah. That would be relevant versus any other Firestones or Fredericks or people that are really in the development mode trying to pay the impact fees to provide the infrastructure, which we don't need to do. Our infrastructure is relatively stable. We're not going to be putting in millions of miles of linear pipe like North Weldon, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's my, my thought is there's probably one or two communities that are like-minded and similarly situated that have been around for a long time that are close to their development um, maximum, at least in terms of threat, mm -hmm. not necessarily down to right. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of them and there's not many, but Four Pounds is probably the one that comes to my mind that's most similar and they're a little bit bigger than we are for sure, but yeah, I think they have a closer similar. Yeah. There is another thing I think to take into account, just and th this is just to, to create context for the city council to judge by, is, is how well and prudently supply, supplied Longmont is. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, so on one end of the spectrum, there's Longmont. On the other end of the spectrum, there is Parker that has greenways all over the place mm -hmm. that they're using, that they're watering by drawing down their water table that's their only water source. I mean, you know, people need to understand that distinction. Yeah. Well, I, I think it was a great discussion, and I know hopefully for the new board members, there's a lot of background and actually a lot that was before my time on here. So I think it's good maybe to get everybody up to speed as well as hopefully getting some discussion and maybe move this forward to council. So thank you for that. Yeah, nice for the staff. So mm -hmm. great. What do we think about about uh, sharing Wes's history with the council? Is there any reason not to do that at this point? I don't think so. I think what you think we have right in the write up, in the write up either. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Let's do that. Yeah. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, in a few of these coming up, so that was um, 9A. We're on the 9B, which is when you get permitting project update. Ken was going to do that. What's you? Uh, you know, the, I, I already mentioned it. If there's anything else, Todd can probably answer or speak to it more than I. Just um, Ken and Marcia and I. Uh, did go to the uh, uh, ceremony of groundbreaking back on August 6th and very well received. And, and again, I believe next week they, they'll actually really be starting to uh, do work and it's going to be impressive. It's going to be, you know, amazing the amount of earth that they're going to move on a, for the next four years. You can't even, it's hard to even put it in perspective. But, Really, that was about the old, and other than that, they did um, issue its bonds for, and I think Kim may have even mentioned that last month, I can't remember, but don't really have anything real significant beyond that, as opposed to a few things. Well, and in the back of the packet, there is materials related to the bond issue, uh -huh. so we can maybe touch base on that when we get to that. Okay. All right, is there any questions anybody had um, on the, when you get from me? Uh, next item is 9C, which is a water resources engineering projects update, Jason. Yes. Uh, I wanted to give you a quick update on uh, three three big projects that are going on. So the South St. Brain Pipeline Rehabilitation Project. So the South St. Brain Pipeline has been out of commission for a better part of a decade. And so we're actually really close to uh, turning it back on. Um, really close as in like you know, six to eight months. But still, um, over a period of a decade, that's relatively close. So, um, we're going to try to do a flow test next week. Um, it's uh, the South St. Green pipeline is not in priority, so but we're going to try to at least turn it on um, and see if we can get some water to flow to the high level pitch and potentially flush out any remaining debris that's in there. Um, we'll do that for you know three or four hours, and once we confirm it's it's working, we'll we'll shut it down. Um, and then the next step will be to, to line the pipe. And so we're going to do a, an NSF approved liner. Um, it's not required, but we felt that you know regulations are going in that direction. So just spend a little bit more money to know that we'll meet future regulations um, made sense. And so um, right now, CNL um, they will be doing CNL Water Solutions will be doing the lining, and um, the liner is on order, and we anticipate starting that in October. So once the liner's in, the only thing that will actually keep us from turning the water on at that point will be the pump station. Because right as we get that liner put in, we'll probably be starting construction on the pump station. So the pump station will be taking water from the South St. Grain pipeline and pumping it into the north. And 
um, in the town of Lyons, the north and the south pipeline parallel each other for a good portion. And so the town of Lyons uh, gave us a permanent easement to put in a pump station there. And so right where the north and the south are about 45 feet apart, we put in a pump station there. And so the main benefit that is, is when the South St. Green pipeline is in priority, which is usually in the wintertime, as opposed to dumping water into an empty highland ditch and then having to put in stop logs to build up enough diversion to get it into Nelson Flanders, we can pump it right into the North St. Green pipeline. So I'm hopeful that I think that um, come April of next year, the pump station will be online for the first time. I don't know whether it will actually be. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <right? laughs> um, no, whether it will actually be taking water deliveries at that time. Uh, CDOT's got the Highway 7 project that's going on, and they're expecting weeks of high turbidity and during weeks, when I say weeks, like one week here, and then next month, this week will be, you know, high turbidity, because they'll be doing work in, in the channel. Um, we won't be taking water during that time. So next year, it'll be on, it'll be off, it'll be on, it'll be off. So, but it will be back into service um, next year. Um, the North St. Rain uh, pipeline alignment and alternate points of diversion study that we're doing right now with Dewberry engineers. So, um, as many of you know, the upper north line from Longmont Dam down to the North Pond, um, you know, we're looking at trying to somehow preserve that, extend the life of that. Um, it's, it's very old, it's in very hard to reach locations, and there's a lot of geohazards. So rocks and trees and stuff, um, uh, water, areas where it's been washed out and the pipe's just hanging, you know. Um, so um, we're looking at uh, possibly realigning the pipe. Um, we're looking at an alternate, a couple alternate points of diversion, uh, maybe another pump station down by the North Pond. Um, the Lion's Old intake structure that's in the North St. Rain just off of Highway 36. Um, having said that, um, there's going to be probably almost a dozen different options we're going to look at, and I suspect that what staff ends up uh, presenting to the board will be a hybrid of let's take option 2A and let's take option 6 and let's look at option 11 and see if we can't combine that into some sort of hybrid. Reason being is um, while the upper north line is really hard to get to, it's, I mean, it's out of the way of people hazards, it survived the flood. Um, the moment you look at taking a diversion anywhere else and, and, and routing it somewhere else, I mean, you, you, you opened it up to vulnerabilities and stuff, and kind of what we saw a few months back with that spill on Highway 36. Um, you, you know, and then um, the North Line through Apple Valley Road and the Town of Lyons, you know, it, it crossed the creek prior to the flood in three different locations, and then after the flood, it was crossing in five different locations. So having a pipeline running adjacent to a creek isn't all that great, so that's why the upper north line, which is on the side of a cliff, is actually very valuable to have. And so um, you had mentioned wanting to do a water tour. Um, when we get closer to presenting the board our study, I would love to take you guys on the hike for the upper north. It's about a three and a half hour hike. It's fairly easy. We'll drive to the top and we'll walk down to um, basically to the pinstock, which is the top of the hydro plant. And so that's the other thing, uh, the hydro plant, you know, there's a sustainability aspect to this. If we start diverting water from a pump station or the lion's intake, that bypasses the hydro plant, which we don't want to do. Hence why that might be a backup when there, if there ever is an incident for the upper north, but I, that's not going to be the permanent solution. And so, um, yes, maybe, oh, I don't know, hopefully maybe November, December, if we'll, you guys don't mind doing it, depending on weather and stuff. There's usually a, a 60 or 70 degree day weather um, in December. Maybe we could go for a hike. Maybe we, maybe we have to wait for spring, but I think um, getting up there and seeing it in person um, really adds to the discussion and, and helps you to kind of wrap your head around, do we want to spend $10 million going this way or do we really want to spend $30 million removing and replacing the pipeline and making it accessible and stuff like that? Maybe look at the amount of hundreds of millions of dollars of water that's coming down that pipe. I mean, it's, it's, 
it's easy to justify it on paper, but funding it, that's 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 where it will probably become challenging. So th those are the three things there. Um, any questions on those or any other projects you'd like to discuss? Those are the three big ones right now. So. Thank you for the update. Nice to know all that with the flood and everything else and all the reliability tying everything together is huge. So as we calm down, yes, good update. Thank you. All right, um, next item, <clears throat> Francie, looks like you're up with the water conservation update. Yes, so um, it's getting towards the end of summer. So most of our resource central programs that Marsha was mentioning earlier are wrapping up. It's always seems that if it rains a lot in the spring, it starts later. So we had much greater participation, but it started more in July. Mm -hmm. For our, um, we do the slow the flow, which is the irrigation assessment. I do, did want to note, um, Resource Central offers the turf removal. Longmont uh, doesn't participate in providing any incentives for our residents right now. So they could participate, but we're not providing any incentives for that program. Um, so that program, we have almost reached the maximum of our budget for the slow to flow, specifically the irrigation assessments. Um, and then we also, through Efficiency Works, for the past since the beginning of last year have been offering irrigation rebates through them. So I also saw an uptick in July as well. Um, and those are interconnected because we require an irrigation assessment for people to get the irrigation rebates. And first thing is you should make sure your system's running correctly before you start replacing things. Um, so we usually see kind of a delay from those. Uh, we haven't been doing as well on the commercial side uh, we, we have been doing that primarily through efficiency works. We just offer indoor rebates with them, but I actually have a conversation tomorrow. Uh, efficiency works serves Port Collins, Loveland, Lockdown, Estes Park. Uh, Estes Park doesn't participate in the water program. So I have a conversation with the other two cities tomorrow about irrigation for commercial. Um, so we're hoping to, we're still, and I think it's still a lot, just the impacts of the pandemic on our commercial entities. They're starting to see in increases in our energy efficiency programs, but just not as much with the water. I just think our water is not expensive enough for that to be like one of the top projects of our businesses. Um, a big effort I've been working on this summer is I've been working with three HOAs to do case studies. All three of them have transitioned their uh, Kentucky bluegrass to beautiful gardens and their water-wise gardens. So we're trying to I'm working, this is through our neighborhood leadership series and our neighborhood group leadership association. And we're trying to make it easier for other HOAs to do the same thing. And we thought case studies and showing how other HOAs in Longmont have done that can help, uh, they're big projects. So I, those three case studies will be probably by the end of this week, live on our website, plus the case study of the transition the city of Longmont did last year, going from Kentucky bluegrass to a wheatgrass blend. And then next Wednesday, I have a presentation with those HOAs to uh, a number of other HOAs through the Neighborhood Leadership Series. So we're hoping that helps inspire more and kind of, again, we're just reducing the barriers to making those transitions for already established landscapes. Um, I wanted to provide an update. Earlier this year, I mentioned we were looking at the St. Vrain Lake and Lenten Water Conservancy District Grant. For a number of reasons, we decided to not pursue that this year. Um, primarily, we, we just realized there's a lot of things up in the air in terms of, for one thing, um, I think Ken has mentioned this, but we have requested an additional half FTE for water conservation. I don't know if everyone's aware, my job is half water conservation, half sustainability. So it'd be bringing us from a half FTE for water conservation to a full FTE for water conservation. So um, I also don't think I'm going to talk this long with a mask on. It's hard. Yeah. Make sure it's nice shorter. <laughs> um, so, um, so just not knowing when that, we're still waiting on confirmation from that going to city council also having to bring that person on. We also are planning our, a much bigger update to our water efficiency master plan. So those members of board who are part of, 
part of the board last year, members, we brought the Climate Action Task Force recommendation. And a big recommendation that the board gave that um, city staff ended up presenting to city council was the recommendation from the Climate Action Task Force was too ambitious. We should not do that. We should go business as usual. But in our next water efficiency master plan update, we should do a reevaluation of our water efficiency goal. So to do that, we are going to start that process next year. So we're going to start our current proposal that we'll propose to city council is take next year and propose different water efficiency uh, goals and current, including our current one, which is 10% of our future water supply by build out, which whatever that term is called now, and then <laughs> uh, then have city council decide on what our new, keep our current goal, have a new goal, and then from that, that we'll spend 2023 then updating our water efficiency master plan. So it's gonna be a much more extensive process because we first gonna evaluate uh, the factors of climate change and into that goal. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I'd just like to comment, Francie, that I think the reason that this board re rejected that CATF uh, recommendation as well as the sustainability board and I don't remember who else um, you know made a recommendation it wasn't that it was too ambitious although it was but it was that it was unsubstantiated it was just you know pulled right out of the air yes and in fact during these discussions I've been thinking about well how would you substantiate a, a recommendation for making our conservation uh, goals more aggressive without um there's there's two mistakes right one is that we don't have any place to store the water and much of the water that runs through longmont can't legally be stored so we are changing our consumption patterns in anticipation of having less water we're not using a lot less water now because we um, can save it up for a dry year because we can't um, so those things need to be understood. The other thing is that uh, I, I think I half suggested that earlier, which is you guys ought to work together because you've got a lot of good data that would allow the substantiation of a recommendation that maybe sustainability doesn't have. Yeah, and I also um, want to highlight, um, kind of building off that, is that at the end of this year, the sustainability plan and the Envision Longmont uh, Multimodal and, and Comprehensive Plan will begin an update. And we are working um, with them to see how can, because we're having the same timeline of the Water Efficiency Master Plan update, how can we integrate them? We've also, since last year, um, when we attended the Growing Water Smart Workshop as staff members, which really focused on integrating land use and water efficiency planning, Staff have from water resources, parks, planning, stormwater, um, and I guess myself, which is both water resources and sustainability, have been meeting monthly to identify opportunities to better integrate that land use and water efficiency nexus. So there are a lot of conversations in the update to the water efficiency master plan. Would definitely both be involved in this board as well as our sustainability advisory board. I think that's great. Anything you can do on the front end instead of trying to retrofit up the fact is time well spent. I've got two questions. One is you were mentioning like on residential audits, you have a budget that you run now. Do you guys still track like how many requests or I guess I'm just thinking if you run out, you know, in August, let's say, you know, do you have some ability to say, well, if we would have had more funding, we could have done this many more audits. Um, it seems like that would be important to know, to know kind of how much more money you can allocate and how much more effective it could be. So I don't know, do you do something like that? We have in the past, so since I've been in the position, the past two, I think, well, first year was a, a ton of water. I don't think people started watering the yards until August. Right. And then last year was COVID. I think people were just distracted. So this will probably be the first year okay. we'll run out. But that's the one, another reason why it's one of the first year we'll run out 
is because in previous year we have increased our slow to flow budget um, to make sure we are meeting that demand because you can and Nelson can probably speak more to that okay. is that we have done that evaluation and decided to okay. increase. So you do look at it and say, okay, what do you think the demand would be going forward to maybe grow it? We saw a large demand with you probably didn't say this right, but we saw for several years a large demand with residential and, and very little with HOA and then it reversed. We had a large amount of HOA the last several months, the years, sorry, and then our residential was dropping off. Yeah. Right there. So, but we did increase the budget, you're correct, yeah, to, we have to meet that need. The only other thing you may be aware of is the Northern District has grant funding for the, especially the HOA product, product for projects, if there needs to be funding, you can, anyway, just so that they know if they yeah. don't have the money in their budget, that may, they can apply for a grant when they have part of the design and they may implement it using the Northern yeah, one of our case studies used the Northern Great. Design, and we've been continuing. So we have opportunities. We uh, push for Northern, as well as we have the Neighborhood Improvement Program, um, as well as a new uh, Sustainable Neighborhood Solutions. And I've been trying to work with uh, our our Neighborhood Resources staff. If in the future, also, can we have this, because these projects are more expensive, can we direct some of our water? Conservation budget to have specific four way tra uh, sure. tripping systems sure. because it, it's great that Northern Water, there's a lot of opportunities, but there's also a lot of well, there's a lot of uh, grant opportunities, but there's also a lot of project opportunities, right? And they're expensive. Well, it's a big bang for your mother. Yeah, that's great. Well, I, uh, thanks for the update. Any other questions or comments? Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> this is bugging me. Build out. Has been replaced with planning horizon. That's your new <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. I'll probably forget next meeting. Right? Yeah, I have it written down. I won't forget. <laughs> All right. So, with that, we're on item 10, which is oh, item 10. Oh, sorry. One, one last thing to be able to follow here. Um, water resources staff is going to offer a raw water tour asking about that for this fall. We didn't do it last year for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and we're limiting it this year to staff and water board. Now some staff has already, the water board's already been on it. I think we have about three staff members right now that are going to go. Um, oh, it's staff too as well. Yeah, so we're trying, trying to keep it to probably one view. And, um, and Nelson and Ken will be kind of helping with that. If you're interested in participating in that, you can just let Heather know, and then she'll coordinate for that. It'll be uh, September 10th, so it's Friday. September 10th is the date that's already been selected, and it typically goes from about eight to two or three o'clock. Heather, so, you can withdraw me from that based on the calendar. Sorry about that. Okay, mm -hmm. no worries. Yeah. Same here. Oh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Was that not enough? Okay. Right. So. Did you hear me? Yeah. And so, and so what we may end up wanting to consider is trying to find a, an alternative or something, or, or maybe get that out sooner. It's it's typically that it's it's historically been that second Friday in September is when we've been doing it for the last ten or twelve years. So, but if there's no reason why we couldn't do something, maybe at a different date for. Can you can you reach out to especially the new board members and see if you can find dates to. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll talk to Ken and see. Yeah, he's been trying to like what what's that for ten years now? He's got it on that second. Yeah. And we can talk to him and see. Well, I think that'd be obviously for these guys would be awesome. Since we're absolutely, you know, absolutely. If that's a possibility. Yep. Okay. All right. Find a date. Great. All right, um, so item 10A is um, items from the board review of major project listings and items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. I think the next month we have when or the cash and lieu, which will yes. tie into our obviously follow up on the discussion we had today. Um, any other questions on upcoming items? Sounds like. Um, and then in September, you may have St. Green left hand. Yeah, we may. We'll, we'll work with. with so the St. Green left hand, is that the, um, David, is that when we were going to do that one meeting with the watershed? 
for the watershed report? Uh, yes, I believe so. It's going to be referring to the combined meeting um, with sustainability, um, the parks and rec board, and in this group. There was a presentation that was given to staff. We thought it was great. It'd be a great opportunity for um, this group and others to hear it without making it. You have to do this. So this is going to be three separate meetings for the presenter, the presenters. So we just wanted to make something that's available. To and kind of what staff is thinking is we would do the water board, and then that would be after the water okay. board. So. Yeah, that's great. Okay, that sounds great. Thank, Thank you, Heather, for what's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Any other questions on items? Okay. Wonderful. So item 11A is informational items and water board correspondence. I think as Wes alluded to, the main item in there is the uh, when you get permit project for chimney hollow bonds were issued. Um, it looks like the interest rates were very good. Yeah, we got a great rate. What was the net? Did you have the net? Come on. Well, that was written down. I remember it. I remember, I don't remember the exact number, but I remember Jim Bowler was very impressed with Yeah, it looked like the net interest cost of that said was 1.84%. That sounds about right. I was never being under two, so that so sounds right. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's any questions, comments on the materials that were in the packet on the correspondence. Item 12, item scheduled for future board meeting. We just talked about cash and lieu. Future board agendas, we'll talk about the chair and vice chair. Yep. Um, next month, um, and then we'll have that joint meeting with the same left hand. So, awesome. Anything else anybody has for the good of the word? I don't see any. If that being the case, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Okay, thanks, everybody.